Good evening, everyone. Um, we're going to start right on time. Um, I see that Zoom participants are still trickling in. Uh, the number is growing, which is great. Um, I'll invite our panelists to come up to the podium. Uh, wonderful. Great. So good evening, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Melanie Tanilian. I'm an associate professor of history, and I'm also the director uh, of the International and Comparative Studies program here at U of M. I welcome you to our second event in a series of conversations sponsored by the Faculty Senate Office and the Davis Marker Nickerson Academic Freedom Lecture Committee, or what we call the DM. And see. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank, of course, the Faculty Senate Office and its amazing staff, uh, Luke McCarthy, Eric Vandenberg, and Anne Marshall, as well as my co-chair, Michael Edsmond, who is on Zoom and is following along and will monitor uh, Q&A there. And it would not have been possible to have this event without all of you. And of course, I want to thank you all for coming out uh, to join us and share your experiences. So tonight's discussion is titled The China Initiative and its Aftermath, the Impact on Science and, um, and the Academic and Intellectual Freedom on Campus. Put in place in 2018 under the Trump administration and the Department of Justice under Jeff Sessions, the China Initiative started as its goal, uh, was, in, uh, was start, uh, started and it stated as its goal uh, to prevent industrial espionage benefiting China. The initiative led to arrest, intimidation, prosecution, and forced resignation of large numbers of faculty on US campuses. About 90% of the more than 70 cases prosecuted under the initiative involved people who were ethnically Chinese or of Chinese descent. After critiques of racially profiling Chinese Americans and US residents of Chinese origins uh, and for being ineffective, um, the China Initiative was officially ended in 2022. But as a recent article in Nature notes, the hostile climate has not dissipated and scientists of Chinese backgrounds still feel the pressure, especially after a proposed House spending bill wanted to bring the initiative back at the beginning of this year. Uh, it didn't manage to do that, but it was the language was in the this, uh, this spending bill. This panel discussion brings together a group of experts who will discuss their personal experiences, the legal dimension, uh, the cost of the initiative in the realm of scientific and technological advancement, the effects on prospective and current students, and on the diversity of American university campuses. This important event would not have been possible without the financial contribution of the Faculty Senate, the Department for Asian Languages and Culture, the College of Engineering, the Ford Pub uh, School of Public Policy, the Libertal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies, the Laboratory of Pramut Zange Reddy, and the Department of Political Science. Leading us uh, this evening, is uh, our resident China expert. Our moderator for this evening is my colleague, Mary Gallinger, the Amy Allen Lovenstein Professor of Democracy, Democratization, and Human Rights at the University of Michigan, where she's also um, the director of the International Institute. Professor Gallagher is an expert in Chin Chinese politics, law and society, and labor politics, and she has authored and edited many books on these topics, um, and her most recent book, Authoritarian Leg Legality in China, Law, Workers, and the State, was published just recently by Cambridge University Press. And I will ask uh, Professor Gallinger to come up to the podium and take over uh, tonight's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Uh, thank you for the invitation to moderate this um, important panel. I'm really happy to be here. 
I'm a, a researcher in Chinese domestic politics, and I've watched the China Initiative very closely as it's affected not only people in the natural sciences and the STEM fields, but also people like me who work on China um, in the social sciences. Um, I'm moderating this panel, so for the most part, I'll be in the over off the Zoom. Uh, I'll come up just as everyone's uh, remarks are finished and um, we have a discussion. I encourage people on Zoom to submit questions so that we can ask them um, when we have time for discussion at the end. And I'll be introducing uh, all of the speakers tonight. So to start, I'd like to introduce Professor Gong Chun. Gong Chun is the uh, Carl Richard Soderberg Professor of Power Engineering at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He served as the department head of the De Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT from 2013 to 2018. He currently serves on the board of the Asian American Scholar Forum, a nonprofit organization working to educate future generations, build leaders of tomorrow, and advocate for the rights of the many Asian American and immigrant scientists, researchers, and scholars who have been subjected to unjust targeting and discrimination. And of course, this lecture and its uh, origins begin um, not with the China Initiative, but with the McCarthy era in the United States in the 1950s. Uh, Gang Chun is an academician of uh, Academy Sinica, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering, and in 2023, he was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. I'm so happy to welcome Gang Chun here to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you, Manly. And thank you, Anne, for uh, inviting me here. Um, I am very grateful uh, for the invitation, and also uh, I know uh, friends at the uh, University of Michigan, uh, you have been well organized, and uh, particularly some of the Chinese faculty took the initiative during a very difficult time. Uh, I want to thank you. And uh, today, uh, I want to share my experience, and the title was actually a quote uh, our for MIT faculty uh, newsletter uh, that uh, say ended with a statement, uh, we are all Gang Chen. And I will tell you uh, what happened to me and also what's happening now, the way I say it. I'm not an expert uh, on, on this. I just uh, say, uh, I say unwillingly become a part of this. So uh, now I learned my lesson and uh, I become more active. Um, so let me uh, share my, uh, let's see. Uh, so uh, we know that the U.S. Department of Energy launched China Initiative 2018. And uh, at that time, uh, I was a little worried, uh, but uh, I would never have imagined what happened to me because uh, I thought I was clean. And uh, yet, uh, in January 2020, uh, I was uh, detained at the Logan Airport when I returned uh, from international trip with my family uh, that turned for a few hours. And they didn't even allow my kids to go to the restroom. And at the end, uh, I was interrogated. My computer and my cell phones were taken away. And the agent asked the passwords to computer and, and uh, uh, my telephone. Uh, I actually want them proud that at that time I already learned from my colleagues who were concerned that it's all right not to give to, uh, give to them. And uh, I had no secret, but I was just angry. So I did not give my passwords to them. I'm very proud it took them a few months to break my passwords. Um, uh, I came back. Uh, I wrote to MIT president that night, and uh, the next day he replied immediately. He said, this is a terrifying. And uh, at the time, actually I thought, why? It's not, to me, I was like, I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, why am I ter terrified? <laughs> so MIT was uh, very proactive. They approached me. They offered me an external lawyer. And again, as a faculty member, I thought, why I need a lawyer? MIT actually hired another law firm to represent MIT in the investigation. So in 2020, 
there are two law firms looking into all my records for the entire year. I was doing my law more teaching, researching, and uh, uh, I, I felt law more. I, I was unhappy, right? But I was conducting all my business because I felt I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, in December 2020, after a year of investigation, uh, they uh, actually, uh, both lawyers know the uh, national security chief in Boston area. And uh, this uh, lady, Stephanie Sigmund, told both lawyers, don't worry, there's not going to be prosecution. Not in the next six months, right? That's very clear, and uh, the lawyer actually told the MIT president. And yet, within a month, on January 14, 2021, that was just uh, six days before the presidential uh, transition, uh, in the early morning, 6.30, I was making coffee. I saw a swamp power for federal agents rushing to my home, right? At the time, my reaction was not fair. My reaction was, I was looking outside, I said, this is stupid. It was stupid. And uh, um, so um, that whole thing was terrible. After a year, uh, in January 20, 2022, uh, the DOJ dropped all charges against me. And a month later, DOJ formally terminated uh, in name uh, the China Initiative. So let me uh, just share a few details how ridiculous uh, this was. Uh, as I said, Stephanie Sigmund, the uh, security chief, uh, 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 see, she told my lawyers, don't worry. And that day of uh, my arrest, uh, she was pretty much apologetic, right? She rushed the case. And uh, um, she said that among all the uh, accusations, uh, she was most angry that uh, I served as a reviewer for China's Natural Science Foundation. That was my worst crime. And uh, uh, you know, th that's because she was pressured by her boss, then U.S. Uh, attorney in uh, the area, uh, Trump appointee, U.S. attorney Andrew Lerling pushed her to arrest me because uh, the presidential transition was going to happen and sh he was going to leave office. He needed a big news conference. That's it. So on that, say in that news conference, he questioned my loyalty uh, to U.S. And uh, in the same news conference, the FBI special agent, that's basically the uh, FBI chief in the area, Joseph Bonavolanto said, we found Chen has accepted pr approximately 29 million in foreign funding. So when you read this, you don't know how funding works. It's like I took 29 million dollars, right? So at home, after they handcuffed me, took me away in front of my wife and my daughter, my wife asked them, what's my crime? And the one agent said, he took $19 million. And my wife was very angry. And she asked, where is that $19 million in my home? And the agent said, at the MIT. So they know it's an MIT contract, <coughs> and they painted it as I took the money home to the public. And. Uh, um, the really, uh, I, we don't have enough time. I summarize based on all the documents that I have, and uh, a lot of this uh, are not public. Uh, but the uh, area of this, my claim here, I have more than one example. I say that's their misconduct in their investigation. They knowingly distort the facts. They criminalize normal scientific activities. They use emails I did not reply as criminal evidence. Following the law and the rule is also a crime. No matter what they do, they, will, they can criminalize you. And they didn't do investigation before they arrest me. And they hide the truth when they interview. There, by if you're a lawyer, you know this uh, say Brady law that uh, anything that the beneficial for the uh, for the defendant, they need to turn to my to my defense team, and they hide it and they don't apologize. They want to get out, they want to make a deal, they, but I refuse it. I just give this same example that Stephanie Sigmund was mostly angry at me 
uh, that uh, say uh, uh, my worst crime was serving as a reviewer for China's Natural Science Foundation. That's because I received the email request, and we know that's part of our profession, right? But I was just too busy, and so I was happy to turn down. So I never did one review, and just be say, receiving those emails was uh, enough for them to say that's my worst crime. You can say how bad it could go, right? So uh, if you want to know detail, I have this uh, YouTube, and you can look at them. Um, but what I want to say is. I really feel, among, despite all this, I'm the luckiest, uh, really among the unlucky people. You'll hear from Peter uh, how, how many more people uh, are targeted, right? Uh, the day I was arrested, uh, MIT president, of course, he couldn't uh, say much, and he wrote, for all of us who know gone, this news is surprising, deeply distressing, and hard to understand. What's more, my colleague, uh, Professor U.F. Fink, he was in the materials department. We never wrote a paper together. He was a director of MIT Research Lab for Electronics, and he didn't know my, uh, that I had a lawyer at the time. He didn't know I was under investigation for a year. He didn't know the government actually lied in their indictment. He just looked at the government's uh, uh, criminal complaint against me, he just looked at the news conference, and he said, this isn't right. So he made slides that light, that slide that I got later on he shared with me, and he called the faculty meeting. The first slide he made was a quote of uh, uh, General Welsh during the Senate hearing in McCarthy era, and the General Welsh asked Senator McCarthy, sir, do you have any sense of decency? And that changed the, uh, the, the media during the McCarthy area. The last slide was this Martin Neumuller's poem, the famous poem, because Martin Neumuller was, uh, uh, say, uh, incarcerated during the Nazi area seven years. He was, uh, he was a priest. And his poem wrote, first it came for this union, a socialist. I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. And then they came for the trade unionists. I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews. I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came to me, and there was no one left to speak out. So the next day, Professor Fink organized a group of faculty. Having, uh, say, they wrote an open letter. In the open letter, they just use whatever government says. They say, those are all the things we do. And the MIT open letter ended with the statement, we are all gang -tren. That essentially started a national movement. So I'm very proud of my colleague. I'm not a hero. My colleagues are hero. And uh, um, actually, uh, this was a slide that your think's daughter made. <laughs> And then he shared with me. And then you look at the, this, how important this letter, right? And when they, when they uh, the day I was arrested, you look at the headline, right? Uh, MIT professor who received 90 million in federal grants arrested for concealing ties to China, right? A week later, MIT newsletter, after newsletter, the uh, media company changed the story, changed the narrative. And the media say, criminal scientist is really dumb, right? So you look at the headlines, that changed the story. And from that, uh, that time on, uh, the government never had a chance to recover from their prosecution on me. There are no chance. But see, um, uh, so I'm very lucky, and I received so much support, I won't mention all of them. And uh, because uh, tonight we're talking about the aftermath, and I just want to uh, share with you uh, the few things, right? Last year, this was an article in Science uh, reporting uh, the uh, NIH prosecution. And really, people live in fear. The, the title of this is the power of suspicion. Here I have a quote. This quote was NIH Deputy Director Mike Lauer. He's Congressional testimony last month. 
and uh, this is in his opening statement. He said that NIH 2018 had received allegations involving over 600 scientists were in the Office of Extra Ex Extramural Research have contact institution in 255 cases. Nevertheless, it's important to keep in mind that for that fewer than one percent, approximately 4,000 NIH funded the principal investigator scientists have been linked to foreign uh, interference concerns. Right. So there are few facts I want to. This this seems a very innocent, right, very uh, righteous statement. First, where are these allegations? Those were allegations. I can only suspect from FBI. Right. Second. You look at science article. In 2000, uh, uh, let's say last year, March, this article, it says it's a two, uh, five, I say 240, 244 uh, uh, investigation. Mike Lauer stated the public, they are continuing the investigation, right? And then he diluted this saying less than 1%. During McCarthy era, Santa McCarthy waved a blank sheet of paper and said, I have names of 205 communist scientists in the US. 205, that's much less than 1%. And think about the damage it has done to the country and to science and to the world. And think about the damage to individuals. And this is the science Nasser re reported, right? Out of this, 103 lost jobs, 155 removed from uh, uh, the federal grants, 81% are Asians. And the other is also uh, just mentioned uh, the uh, nature uh, and the science article. They later talked about the custom the faculty went through, and a lot of them come to me because they want to share their experience. They don't dare to speak, speak out. So in this article, you won't see one Chinese faculty name because they are so afraid. One brave uh, colleague, uh, this is a, a say, Caucasian colleague, and uh, George Kaliadakas from Brown University spoke out because he was stopped twice, interrogated twice at Logan International Airport, and uh, his computers or cell phones were taken away. And this happened to many people, many people. There was one colleague, he told me, he was in target five hours. This is a, uh, a say, faculty member in another university from, and she was born in Taiwan. And she said that she debated them, and she brought up my name, and this was in October 2022, 10 months after my case was dropped. And the customs said I was guilty. That was the custom agent said. So um, this happened, this is still happening, and this is happening to a lot of people. <coughs> and then it also happened to students, visitor, visitors. On January 1st, 2022, uh, 20, 22, I received a call from a distressed uh, colleague, and he said that he, uh, they, they were expecting a visitor, and uh, uh, they uh, say she landed, and, uh, but say after that, there are no no, no message. They were waiting outside, and I said, you better go talk to MIT Negro. Uh, what happened is the person landed, and the 36 hours later, uh, she was in return to China. And it turns out that just uh, at the MIT, and now four cases. There was another student. When he entered custom, right, and the student, the, the custom agent said, you are connected to Chinese military. This was a student just graduated from Tsinghua University. And he said, no. And then the agent said, I'll search you, right? And uh, in the photo, they found one photo. He was wearing Chinese un a military uniform. <laughs> Anybody who knows China knows, because every student, when they first go to college, they, were, they, they have two weeks of military training. Right, so they know they can find the photo, and that student was warned. Said during your, he he eventually let the custom let him in, but warned him during those years the FBI will follow you, and if you ever work on the government funding project, you'll be put in prison. 
That was the threat he received when he went through the custom. And this happened, this is a really creating a, a big chilling effect. And this was a, a Asian American Scholar Forum, which was launched after uh, I was arrested. And they did a, a conduct a survey. Some of the, you probably filled the form. And this survey is 130, uh, no, 1,300, over 1,300 university faculty members, most of them Chinese origin uh, in US. And they say 72% feel unsafe. And uh, uh, 65 worry about collaboration with China. And uh, um, really just to say uh, over 60% are thinking leaving US. And so this is a, this is a think about the damage that could cause to, your, to the scientific uh, say enterprise and to US. And in fact, this figure is very, those are the two different sources, two graphs. Um, the first one is uh, OECD, that including, this is U.S. Uh, government uh, uh, organization, including 38 developing, developed countries, the data shows. This is, uh, you, you don't uh, say very well, so let me explain. The vertical axis is, uh, this is a 4,000, 3,000, 2,000. So these are the uh, international net flow of scientific authors. And the green one is uh, US. 2018, gaining over 4,000 per year, new researcher, scientific authors. And now it's negative. Now it's actually negative below, uh, below zero. We are losing that talent. Those are the data from the government. And this is another study conducted by Professor Shea from Princeton University. And this is, a, uh, he looked at all the data on literature and looked at the change of senior authors. And you can see this is a number of experience, US-based Chinese dis, uh, descent scientists moving to China. <coughs> and you can see since the launch of China initiative, this curve, rapidly rise. Right? People are forced out. And this is a stupidity. It's damaging US competitiveness, damaging the US national security. We say, okay, anyone who get, should get a medal from a, a Chinese government, that's the FBI, that's the DOJ, right? They are sending talent back. So what I will learn is that we have to speak out. And uh, this is an Asian American scholar forum. He has been doing a lot of work. And uh, we learned we need to speak out. And, uh, and before, say so I said, I do science. I'm not related to politics. But policy will come to haunt, haunt us, right? And uh, uh, the, uh, it was mentioned uh, the Congress wrote into the budget, relaunching China initiative, the article was put, already put in the congressional budget for this year. And the uh, ASF led a coalition of over 50 uh, uh, organizations and worked with Congress. And the, the, in the final version, they took it out. And uh, before the CHIPS Act uh, was enacted, there was a senator want to insert a clause, a uh, last minute article. And the article basically says any international support over $1,000. And if you don't report, that's a federal crime. That was a, a last minute addition. And then uh, because of last minute, there are congressional Senate procedures that you need a unanimous uh, uh, say consent. Senator Maria Cantor, Cantor from Washington State widowed. Turns out that I talked to her office two weeks just before the, the, uh, the, this final. So I feel that this engagement is, uh, could, could sometimes work, and uh, we just can't wait until other people do the work for us. I don't go government for funding, but uh, I think it's my duty to speak out. So we actually uh, were very at the White House. This is uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Prabhaka, director of OSTP, 
And uh, uh, Ms. Morisugo, she is the uh, assistant, deputy assistant to uh, President Biden uh, Asian, uh, on, uh, for Asian people. And let me just stop here. I just want to say this was a colleague uh, that was uh, before my case was dropped. He sent me an email and uh, uh, sent me this photo. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. That was from Martin Luther King wrote it, writing from prison. Thank you very much. I'm very uh, grateful for, for having this chance to speak here. This is for me to read out. Um, for the participants on, on Zoom, mm -hmm. the room is 70, mm -hmm. and the Zoom number is 101. I have no idea what that means, but <laughs> yes, to the participants. Oh, I'm sorry. It's how many people are here. I thought it was like a passcode. Um, oh, this is great. Okay, so yes, there are 101 people listening on Zoom, uh, which means questions will be very um, vibrant. Sorry, I thought there was some secret thing that I was telling people on Zoom. Um, our next speaker is Peter Zeidenberg. Peter is an attorney and partner at Arendt, Fox, and Schiff. Uh, you can see his bio and his accomplishments in the handout today, so I won't read everything, um, but it's very impressive. Peter's practice focuses on the representation of scientists, academics, entrepreneurs, and other individuals and business organizations accused or suspected of economic espionage, theft of trade secrets, government contracting and procurement fraud, export violations, espionage-related offenses, computer crimes, the False Claims Act, wire and mail fraud, and the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, he will be speaking on uh, the China Initiative and its impact on academics around uh, many of these um, accusations and um, suspicions. So I'm really welcome. I'm really happy to welcome Peter to the podium. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> Professor, the, uh, hearing you speak, um, what struck me uh, most was that your situation, what was unique about it, um, was certainly not the fact that you got arrested and not the fact that you got charged and investigated. What was really unusual was the reaction of your colleagues in MIT, um, because unfortunately that has not been the experience of most universities. Um, it's actually just the opposite. Um, what I have found um, again and again is that the universities all of a sudden stiff arm their professors and they say to these granting agencies, which they are terrified of alienating because of this research grant money, they say, it was him. You know, he did it. He lied to us. And they don't say, well, you know what? To be honest, we've never given a training on how to do this. We've never given a, any explanation. Uh, and in fact, we're the ones who submitted this paperwork. And in fact, we did know that he was doing all this uh, activity in China. We didn't think it was relevant either. No one did. Um, although all those facts are true, that's not what they say. They say, go get them. Um, just keep, you know, just keep giving us the, the grant money. So it's, it's really, uh, really unfortunate. Um, let me just give you a, a little bit of the background on the China Initiative. Many of you um, probably are aware of this, but it began in uh, 2018 with an announcement by the FBI and the then Attorney General uh, Jeff Sessions, and they uh, made clear that the U.S. government viewed China as the number one threat to the United States and a threat to the United States uh, intellectual property and economic vitality. So November 1st, 2018, they launch what they call a China initiative. The goal was to combat the national security threat supposedly 
posed by China by focusing on identifying and prosecuting those engaged in trade secret theft, hacking, and economic espionage. And, and to tell you the truth, um, if this was an accurate description of what the China Initiative did, there really would not have been grounds to complain. Because as U.S. citizens, you know, nobody here should be defending uh, people who are engaged in, well, I defend them. But, but you understand why the, why the government has a, a strong and, and justified interest in prosecuting trade secret theft, hacking, and economic espionage. But, you know, like when you're prosecuting people like Professor Chen, that wasn't even the allegation. And, you know, he didn't get in and, and discuss too much the details of the allegations in his case, but I will talk about the ones in mine. And his case was very, very similar to all the ones I have, where the allegation doesn't have anything to do with economic espionage or trade secret theft. It's simply not filling out on your grant paperwork that you were a thousand talent scholar back in 2014, or that you taught, um, you had an affiliation with a, your, your alma mater in China um, in the summers when you weren't getting paid by your university. So Christopher Ray, these very threatening um, quotes that you can see about the threat that's posed by China, that the Chinese government is determined to acquire American technology. They're willing to use a variety of means to do that. So this is what was sort of the, the big disconnect. Um, and you know one of the disconnects that uh, Professor Chen was talking about, which doesn't really surprise me, was this question of, oh, you're getting, you got $19 million. That's why we're going after you. And it, it reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of how grants work. And that is endemic in the, um, by these investigators. In, in the case I tried in um, Kansas, you know, they, in the indictment, they say, you know, one of the objects of this fraud is grant money. That, you know, that's what supposedly is being stolen. But the grant money doesn't go, as, as researchers know, the grant money doesn't go to the individual, it goes to the university. And they dole it out in salaries and lab expenses and whatnot that are all approved. Every one of those expenses is approved. So, you know, it's a fundamental disconnect about how that works. Um, and the other fundamental disconnect is they do not understand the nature of fundamental research. They seem to think that a professor who is getting grants from NIH or National Science Foundation um, and are doing you know, this great research and then they go to China, or any other country, but China primarily, and they're sharing this information as if that is a bad thing. And, you know, you can kind of understand it, but it just reflects a total lack of sophistication and understanding of what's going on. Because they're coming from this from a perspective of uh, trade secret theft, like in a company. You know, if you work for Apple and you were doing that, yeah, that would be a big problem. If you work for Raytheon and did that, that would be a huge problem. But when you're working for the, you know, grants for the University of Michigan, that's what your job is, is to engage in scientific intercourse like this where you're sharing the results of your research. It's fundamental and they do not understand the difference between applied research where you're trying to solve a particular problem and, you know, this could be patentable or, um, you know, there could be a real financial benefit to that versus what normally what this funding goes to, which is 
of fundamental research, which is just sort of science for science sake. And yeah, maybe someday down the road, someone will figure out a way to monetize it. But that's not the purpose of the research. Um, government agents investigating this have no understanding. So as a result, um, what happened is they've got this target. Um, you know, and an imperative to bring these cases. They were told every single U.S. Attorney's Office, and there's 93 in the United States, every single office should bring a case. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that's like saying, you know, I want speeding tickets. You know, I, are there people speeding on this road? I, that's not the question. I want tickets. What's going to happen? you know, you're going to get abuse and you're going to get people who are pulled over for speeding going 31 miles an hour because they have quotas. And these agencies, these U.S. Attorney's offices, especially in the smaller offices, were focused on making arrests. And they could not find these cases involving economic espionage and trade secret theft and hacking. They couldn't find those cases. So instead, what do they do? They find professors who didn't report on their grant paperwork affiliations they had in China years previously. And did it matter to the agencies, to the granting agencies? Not really. They didn't care. I mean, they're looking for people who are qualified to do the work. And if you're qualified to do the work, and a lot of this grant paperwork, for those of you who, who don't know, you know, they give you two pages, and they, they want your, your bio. And these professors have bios that, uh, CVs that can go 30, 40 pages long, including all of their, uh, all the papers they've ever worked on, all the grants they've ever worked on, all the research they've ever done. So they pick the highlights. And if they leave out, you know, I also was an, uh, an adjunct professor for two years during these summers, they'll say, well, that was a material omission. Um, we gave you this grant, so you're guilty of wire fraud. Fortunately, um, these cases, um, they, they brought case after case after case that from starting in about 2019, um, till 2023, uh, many of these were my clients, and what happened is they fell apart for the most part. Some of these individuals, unfortunately, did not have money, and they were strong-armed into pleading guilty, but the ones that were able to fight it, uh, like Professor Chen and uh, my clients, we were able to um, beat these cases and persuade the courts that this is a theory that um, isn't supported in the law because there is no fraud when the research is done and the granting agency is satisfied with the research. So they're getting the research, they're paying for the research, the research is being done, papers are being written. How are they defrauded? How is the government defrauded? And it took um, quite some time, but eventually um, the, the um, courts began to realize that it's true that that is actually not a crime. And that's, that was the um, success we eventually began to have. And as a result of all of these um, wins that we had and losses of the government, they announced the shutdown of the China Initiative. And they shut that down in um, February of 2022, two years ago. Um, and Matt Olson of the National Security Division said, you know, they're going to refocus this, um, basically do what they were supposedly uh, doing from the beginning. Um, but importantly, um, and these are some of the failures, and they, Professor Chen's was one of the important cases that they lost. Um, they replaced the China initiative, they took the name out, and they call it the Disruptive Technology Strike Force, and they announced that in 2023. So it's a, a different name um, for, I think they felt sensitivity from objections from the Chinese American community 
um, that China was being, you know, the it was too ethnic centered. Um, so they've taken out the name China. Um, I don't really see a huge difference. Um, but I, I, I do want to talk just a little bit from a, a legal perspective how these investigations um, operate. Um, and, and, you know, Professor Chen alluded to this. You know, they get allegations. I mean, some of these, unfortunately, are from colleagues who, for whatever reason, or maybe, you know, who knows why people report a colleague, but they send the letter, maybe they're jealous, maybe they're personal animus, whatever. And, you know, they know that they're spending summers in China or they're traveling to China and they initiate an investigation. So these agencies come in, they'd be inspector generals for the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy or, um, uh, oftentimes NIH, and they go through all of the grant paperwork that's been submitted, and they're looking at the bio sketch, and they're looking at the grant application and all of the forms that are that are submitted with that paperwork, and then they're going back to your travel records, your your passport records, and all of your emails, and so. A lot of times people will um, be communicating with colleagues and they'll get offers. Sometimes they're followed through on, sometimes they're not. You know, people do generally do not tell their employer when they're considering employment at another school or another, um, uh, another institution. And so they make assumptions, well, you, you got this offer you know, my case in, in Kansas, he had an offer to go to, this is Franklin Tao, he had an offer uh, at a university in China. He went there, but he didn't take the job. And there's paperwork that goes back and forth and back and forth, and there's offers and there's counter offers, offers and counter offers, and nothing is ever signed. They never agreed, and you know, he said he didn't think that they were really gonna come through with all this grant funding that they were promising. They never had a meeting of the minds, but you know, they arrested him at gunpoint and charged him with 10 felonies. Um, so unfortunately, what was happening is they would, they would see a disconnect based on these emails and these records and the grant fraud and the, and the grant applications, and they didn't then have a conversation with the individual to say, you know, look, we got some questions about your paperwork, could you come in and we can talk about it? No. They get a search warrant, they get a few dozen agents, they come by at 6.30 in the morning in front of all your neighbors, they, they knock on the door, they arrest you, take all your stuff. It's an um, incredibly heavy-handed approach. So the consequences, um, again, Professor Chen alluded to these, but I have client after client who are not charged in criminal cases as a result of this, but nevertheless, their grant funding is canceled. So they cannot get grants from their agencies. And as a result, they can't stay. They can't do their research. And the perverse result of that is the only place they can go to work at that point is China. And that's where they are. They have more clients than I can uh, count when I contact them, they are working in China. And they're making do, I can't say they're miserable. That's not what they wanted though. They were very happy, every single one of them, with where they were. But you know, these are people who are very focused on their work and they just want to be able to do their work even though their families <laughs> invariably stay behind and they'll come back and they'll visit back and forth. But um, you know, it's a really a tragic consequence. Um, to, to us, to the, to, to the U.S. Um, it has a very um, negative impact on, 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 um, on the U.S. Um, research abilities. 
Um, and for those who are wondering what the red flags are, um, prior involvement in foreign talent programs, particularly thousand talent program, it's an enormous red flag for um, investigators. Um, they, U.S. investigators view these talent programs with a great deal of um, suspicion, even though at one time they were considered here to be a real badge of honor and something that um, professors typically listed on their bio and on their resume, and they got accolades from their colleagues and their uh, department chairs for getting this award. Um, so non-disclosure of that is, is often deemed as an intentional, um, intentional uh, fraud. Um, so for these non-disclosures, the labs closed. Um, they're often banned from campus. Um, they lose their position. Um, you know, it's a, it's a tragic and, and really, um, you know, the impact can't be overstated, even when there is no criminal case. The criminal case are the ones we read about in the newspapers, and obviously that's worse because there's the threat of incarceration and it costs a great deal of money. Um, but for those that aren't charged, it's not like they um, dodged the bullet. They're still severely impacted. So these are the, the factors that put you most at risk, in my opinion. Um, the ethnic Chinese background, um, U.S. funded grants, uh, affiliations with Chinese universities, and participation in Chinese talent programs, particularly Thousand Talent Program. And, you know, the, the consequences of this are immense. Now, I, I will say I think there are fewer of these cases coming down the pike as of late. I haven't seen, I have seen a, a diminution of them. But, again, these are the ones that are um, criminal. The ones that are going administrative and they're just their funds are taken off, there's really nothing that I can do at that point. So, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Our third speaker tonight is Professor Rachel Jia from the University of California, San Diego, where she's an associate professor of economics at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. Uh, professor Jia is one of the most um, creative and I think um, interesting economists publishing on China right now. No disrespect to your colleagues in the econ departments. Um, one area of her research examines elite formation and its influence both in historical and contemporary contexts. And she has also published uh, some important papers on the impact of the China Initiative on American science, which she'll be speaking about tonight. So thank you so much, Professor Jia. Uh, thanks again for the opportunity. Uh, I'm an economist uh, interested in science, the technology, and the innovation. So when I approach uh, China Initiative, it's not too personal, uh, although you know it's become personal by talking with the scientists, etc. Uh, but more like I'm motivated by this broad question: What does this imply for science? Uh, you know, as as social scientists, can we provide evidence-based uh, research to inform policy debate? We know. There are a lot of debates on this policy. You hear, you know, the downside of this if, uh, of this China initi initiative. But if you talk with, you know, the other camp, they may say, "Oh, look, this is what we exactly want to do. <laughs> we want to punish some scientists." Uh, so, you know, then you know, po evidence become very useful. It's like, oh, if you look at what's going on, uh, in, especially in U.S. science, has this policy achieved the intended? Uh, uh, impacts, etc. So that what motivate me uh, in this research. Interesting. Uh, see the. Hmm. Oh, okay, great. Oh, okay, that's great. Uh, so let me give you a little bit uh, a broad contest. 
uh, from a, you know academic background how how we do this research. Uh, as we all know, like science has been becoming more and more international uh, in recent decades, right? If, uh, that not only international collaboration uh, in scientific production become more and more common, if you look at the most influential research or the most productive scientists, they often involve international collaboration. Uh, and economics has done very nice influential uh, studies showing that international collaboration, flow of ideas, and, um, and the flow of talents is very important for innovation, especially in the land of opportunity like the US. Uh, but on the other hand, we should also admit that politics matter. Uh, you know, first, you know, uh, Science and technology is an important component of economic growth and military capacity. Government is a very important founder. You know, they found uh, academic research. So in this sense, it's kind of a valid concern that international collaboration might have issues. Oh, okay, has issues about you know intellectual property rights, linkage. Uh, there may be concerns about ethics, human rights. So international relations naturally would affect science. I would tell you, economics don't study international relations because we are often study with like we call it large aim problem. When it comes to IR, it's like two countries. Oh, we don't know how to study it. But now with all these new tools, new new forms of data, etc it's become, I think, a good time for students here, whether you are in economics, political science, or sociology, it's a good time to think about these big uh, questions. Uh, so I intended to report to you an agenda, but I, I know it will be short talk, so don't worry about the number of slides. I would be brief. Uh, this is the agenda I joined, uh, joined with my political science colleague uh, at UCSD on different aspects we are studying. So uh, today I just talk about the first project, how look at how this uh, intentions affected uh, science, especially life sciences uh, in the context of NIH investigations talked about pe uh, uh, by Peter. Uh, we also did some survey experiment to get the attitudes for about policy, US policy makers, academics, think tank people, politicians, how they think about decoupling from China in terms of scientific collaboration. I'd be happy to tell you more uh, in the Q&A. And finally, we also look at student flows. And um, that may be very close to you know, the students here and their, your own experience. But today, just in this very brief talk, I just talk, just to share with you a research which would be uh, forthcoming soon uh, in the field of life sciences. So the background is, you know, the Chinese China Initiative concerns many field life sciences because NIH funding is very important. It's one of the major area that has been affected, uh, and there's, you know, in this field there are a lot of discussion debate. But again, there's very little evidence, so that's motivated our analysis. So we are you know, curious about, is there real, has there been a chilling effect uh, on US-China scientific collaboration? You know, we hear about these cases, but you know, as uh, actually Gang Chen mentioned, you know, some policymaker would say, oh, this is only about 1% of the scientists. Is this really has a large impact on science? The second is, you know, uh, has researchers with collaboration history with China been negatively affected or how much? And which fields you know, and which institution are more likely to be affected? And finally, of course, the big question is, what does this mean for US competitiveness, for US-China competition in science and innovation? Uh, so we have three main findings. The first is actually this investigation is associated with an excellent decline of productivity of, for scientists who had a collaboration history with China. So we compare U.S. scientists who had a collaboration history with China versus other U.S. scientists who collaborated with other countries. Uh, if you look at only count the number of publications, the effect is not too large, it's 2%. But if once you are take into account the citations, actually the effect becomes sizable. You know, re Remember, this is a very short run. It's only in a few years it's already sizable. So it just says that there's a very large chilling effect. 
uh, and when you look at when we look at which fields are most affected, motivated by the question like, oh, are the fields associated with national security uh, more affected or not? I, I can tell you in the end, it's difficult to define the boundary. What we find is that actually the fields that had more uh, U.S.-China collaboration and the fields that needs more <laughs> NIH uh, funding are the most affected, negatively affected. Finally, uh, is this good news for, you know, U.S., bad news for China uh, in terms of whole country competitiveness in these life sciences? What we find is actually both countries are hurt. It's unclear which country gets hurt more, at least in this uh, uh, recent few years we have been looking at. Uh, uh, here, just give you an idea of this aggregate uh, pattern, the trend of a collaboration in life sciences between U.S. and China. This is a picture from a U.S. perspective. Uh, as you, see, you can see, the China, you know, has, if you, as you can imagine, you know, whenever you study China, you see a faster trend in recent years. So China was, became the number one uh, collaborator in, of the U.S. Uh, in, of US uh, since 2014, but, and it had been increasing. But as you can see, uh, around, around 2018, the trend slowed down and even uh, reversed. And if you look at from China perspective, how important the U.S. as a partner uh, in the life sciences for Chinese scientists, I would say first, it's even more important uh, if you pay attention to the y-axis, no need to pay attention to the detail, but I will tell you that U.S. is even more important for China, but even from China's perspective, the trend also changed uh, in recent years. Uh, and what we do in this paper is just compare the publications of, uh, we compared about uh, 35,000 PIs, uh, these are principal investigators who had a collaboration history of China, with China before 2014, and those who uh, we call them control group, like about 78,000 uh, 70, uh, scientists who collaborated with other international countries. If the pattern basically said, you know, these two groups of scientists are relatively comparable in terms of trend. It's true that those collaborated with China are more productive on average, but in terms of their publication trend, they're on the similar trends, but after 2018, actually those, those who had a collaboration history with China, uh, their productivity declined, especially if you take account uh, into their, uh, take into account their pub, uh, citations, which measure the, the impact of research. So not only quantity, the impact is more negatively affected. Uh, we, are also, we also have a look at the different institutions because, you know, is that true that MIT, which we heard a lot about, uh, and those, you know, has been reported on the news are more negatively affected? We don't find this the case. It seems that it's pretty general phenomena across institu uh, U.S. institutions. Many institutions were not in the news much. Uh, perhaps like Michigan, uh, etc. So then it's you know the effect is still there. So it's not that the media really pick up what's going on. There, there are many investigations, even though the institution was not really spot on the spotlight. Uh, and these two figures, just to the just to show, oh, which field is more negatively affected? Uh, the x-axis is say, the share of NIH funding uh, or the, the, the share of U.S.-China collaboration in the past, and you see this very strong negative uh, line, which means, oh, if the, fair, the, the field has used to have more, rely on more on NIH funding, or used to have more uh, China-U.S. collaboration, uh, much more negatively affected. Well, uh, we can discuss, you know, if perhaps later, what does this imply in terms of national security uh, concerns. Uh, and uh, we then we look at, you know, what does this imply for the two countries? Uh, is that, you know, China may be like, you know, you can have different conjecture. Maybe, oh, this, we want to hurt China. <laughs> so, uh, but would that hurt U.S. more or, or U.S. benefited? Uh, so what we look at is we look at the publication in life sciences across 50 countries. So China, U.S., and 48 other major countries in, in terms of publication. And we look at their relative progress uh, over time. And the finding that the, this correlation basically said if a field, a subfield in life sciences is more negatively 
affected by U.S.-China uh, uh, tensions, this field also progressed less uh, fast or more slowly. And this is true for U.S. and for China. So it looks like both countries are, hurting, are hurt by these tensions. It's difficult f so far within the you know, five years we, we have been looking at it so far, it's difficult to tell which uh, country uh, got uh, hurt more. And we also interviewed uh, scientists in this process. We interviewed about 12 scientists, and then the messages actually converge. Uh, as actually hinted in the earlier discussions, uh, this, the, 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 the scientists are, are really affected in multiple ways. This is not that one way. Uh, and you know, administratively costly. Now they have to fill uh, fill much more forms, and they are more careful about traveling to China, etc. And this also is related to uh, the access of machines. Of course, students, etc. Uh, machines are interesting because when I before I interviewed them, I didn't know that actually some machines are very costly, and Chinese government uh, bought many machines, etc. And they were talking about they would reorienting their research topics, et cetera, but not in the short run. In the short run, it's difficult to do. So if we follow up this in the medium and the long run, maybe we we'll even find some uh, orientation of topics. Uh, it's true that uh, uh, the China in official China initiative ended, uh, as, as we hear. However, none of the scientists we interviewed believe that this is really ending. Uh, so they think the tensions would you know, keep going on. And there's certainly very clear retirements of starting new projects with China. So the, the, you often hear like, oh, yes, I have some ongoing project. I probably still finish it. But to start in new ones, I would be very, very, very careful. So if you look at follow this, we, we probably, you know, what we find so far probably is a lower bound of the effects. Uh, I want to bother you with other fascinating studies, uh, but uh, because I leave that uh, to the Q&A, I just want to make a re re remark about the, how I, what I learned in terms of uh, uh, the policy making uh, of science. So we have to uh, you know, acknowledge that US-China is competing <laughs> in science, what, but what would be the right policy? Uh, you may hear that uh, there's the current policy is sometimes framed with this phrase called uh, small yard and high fences. Right, uh, but when you work, you know, when you do, when we research on science or research on students, uh, we look at the different sensitive fields, etc. The challenge is often very difficult to def to define the boundary of the yard. What is a sensitive field? What is which field is about national uh, security? These are very difficult to define, and that's why this policy has all these unintended consequences. Uh, and uh, partly because institutions are risk averse, they rely on government funding, etc. So I would like, you know, maybe in Q and A we can have, a, you know, if there's some discussion about what would, you know, if this is not the right policy, what would be alternative policy, right? It's not that we should forget about competing with China. Anyway, so uh, I'll shut up here and uh, uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Jia. Our last speaker is Professor Anne Sherlin. Anne is an associate professor of public policy in the Gerald R. Ford School at the University of Michigan. She's also the director of the Lieberthal Rogel Center for Chinese Studies at the International Institute. And she's worked very uh, diligently on these issues um, involving the China Initiative and Asian American discrimination in the United States. So I'm really happy to end uh, our panel tonight with uh, Professor Lin. Thank you. So thank you so much to the University Senate for sponsoring this event today, and especially to Melanie Tanelian, Michael Atzman, and Alex Yi for planning this panel. I also want to say how much I appreciate the talks of my fellow panelists, and particularly the courage of Professor Gongchen, who has continued to speak up and speak out on this subject, despite the difficult memories it raises, and the cost of time and attention that he could otherwise devote to his own scholarship. The message that I think we've all sent to you today is that the China Initiative and its effects are not over. 
They are part and parcel of a larger attack that we see on universities in the United States. But because they are overwhelmingly directed at an ethnic minority, Chinese Americans, these can be dismissed as special cases of foreign interference. Now, foreign interference isn't my phrase. It's the phrase that the National Institute of Health has been using for the last seven years. When you hear foreign interference, you naturally think of spies who have been sneaking around falsifying research results. And as I'll explain in a minute, that's not what NIH means. But it's also not a joke. Last May, Florida passed a law restricting private universities, not only from collaborating with Chinese universities, but even from hiring graduate students, postdocs, or other researchers from China. International students can still go to Florida schools, but they can't be employed or paid for by a lab. Now, not wanting to be deemed anti-Chinese, I suppose, the legislature specified seven countries of concern from which researchers are banned. China, Iran, Russia, Syria, Venezuela, Cuba, and North Korea. I will pause here and say that if you want students from communist or Islamist countries to appreciate the benefits of American freedom and openness, this is exactly not the policy that you would want to pursue. But that's what happens when you use terms like foreign interference to describe ordinary scientific activities. You end up by criminalizing categories of people based on where they come from. Now let me get back to the NIH. Since 2018, NIH has investigated 639 scientists, fewer in the last two years, but over 100 a year from 2018 to 2021. Of these, it has contacted universities in 255 cases. 44% of those scientists, 111, have been terminated or resigned or retired early from their universities, including at least four here at the University of Michigan. In the vast majority of cases, these professors have tenure. So how is it possible that we are not hearing more about these cases? Well, I think our previous speakers have already explained some of what happens. NIH contacts universities and tells them that there is concern about a particular faculty member on a particular grant. When universities get this information, they do not have to contact the professor in question. As a matter of fact, usually they don't. And we have been told by University of Michigan leadership that they don't because they don't want to worry or bother professors in, with the potential accusation. Now, NIH makes it very clear to universities that if the faculty member cannot be cleared, not only will NIH require universities to repay that grant, the university's entire NIH portfolio of grants will be investigated. So the university then goes to the professor in question and says, well, we don't want you to be prosecuted, but we also don't want your colleagues' grants to be jeopardized. If you will retire early or resign voluntarily, all of this will go away. And so these faculty don't get fired, which would require a disciplinary hearing. They don't file a grievance because they are resigning voluntarily. They don't even talk about their cases, not only to protect themselves, but also to protect the university. So what does NIH consider conduct grave enough to warrant termination or, in another 20% of cases, institutional exclusion from grants? Meaning, of course, not just that you can't keep your NIH grant, but you cannot apply for other research funding. 84% of those ha of people who were in this category had an undisclosed affiliation with a Chinese university. 70% had undisclosed grant support. 
52% had an undisclosed talent award. And as you've already heard, that means they accepted an honorary or paid position at a Chinese university, generally including grant money to support research in China without disclosing this talent award to NIH. Now notice what this doesn't say. It doesn't say that the professor's talent award required the professor to deliver research results or assign patents to China. It doesn't say that the professor was double dipping, that is, getting grant money from NIH to support exactly the same work that the professor was funded for by a Chinese agency. It doesn't even say that the professor lied about his affiliations. Rather, faculty are being sanctioned for the failure to disclose a conflict of commitment. And I'll say that again, a failure to disclose. In some cases, as we know from cases that have been prosecuted, neither NIH nor the universities were clear about what needed to be disclosed. But let's assume they were. I will simply ask, in the absence of any evidence of a research security violation, do we really want professors to be forced to resign because they intentionally or unintentionally did not comply with disclosure requirements? I feel like Allen Iverson, practice? Just to be blunt about this, do we want Asian faculty who were 70% of those investigated to be targeted for non-compliance with disclosure requirements. I think it's tremendously important to take seriously the kind of administrative and institutional discretion that is used to handle these cases. The fact that these investigations and their results are not public contributes significantly to the climate of fear that Chinese American scientists are dealing with. It prevents effective political organization while civil rights groups were able to get the Justice Department to end the China Initiative, they have been less successful at addressing the kinds of investigations that I have described to you today. As a matter of fact, every federal granting agency over the past two and a half years has adopted new disclosure requirements with which they are using to, um, to explore their grant recipients. Now here I want to give at least one shout out to the NIH because they at least publish summary statistics of their investigations. But unfortunately, I am afraid that what the federal government is learning is that quiet discrimination is much more effective than noisy discrimination. A different example. In 2020, President Trump issued a proclamation suspending the entry of students and researchers who had studied at, conducted research at, or were employed by universities in China who implement or support the PRC's civil military fusion strategy. The fear is that Chinese researchers were coming to the US to steal research results and new technologies for China. And this is a reasonable security concern. So what's the problem? The problem is that the term civil military fusion strategy is defined in a way that if applied to the United States would implicate every university that has grants from the Defense Department or its subsidiaries. More importantly, a list of problematic Chinese universities or university departments does not exist. So how does the federal government decide which students or researchers to exclude? What this proclamation has meant in practice is that any US counselor officer in China issuing a visa and any customs and border protection agent examining that visa upon a student's entry to the United States can deny entry based on that official's belief that the student might have some connection to a Chinese university participating in China's civil military fusion strategy. In other words, this is not 
based on a set of clear criteria that we have reasonable research security concerns about. This is based entirely on the judgment of the particular visa officer or CPB agent who is speaking to the student on that day. The implementation of this effort to ensure research security thus leads to capricious and unreviewable decisions because none of these decisions are ever published. There is no count kept of visas that have been denied. It licenses questions, however, directed at faculty, including American citizens when they return to the US at the border, including, as we have already heard, requests that they turn over their phones, laptops, and passwords. But worst of all, I don't think it keeps it doesn't, it, I don't think it contributes to keeping US research safe from Chinese espionage or Chinese misuse. Thank you so much for your attention and concern this evening. I'm going to end here and I really look forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Uh, we have uh, some time for questions, and I'd like to invite the audience to um, ask a question. And I believe we have mics for people to use bo at both sides. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Sonia Rangraj. I am uh, one of the physicians at Michigan Medicine. I'm really curious um, how this affects medical doctors. I did see in one of the presentations that you talked about a medical student uh, being affected by some of these targeted uh, attacks from the FBI in terms of these investigations. And obviously, any information that would be on a personal laptop would contain patient data and therefore be a major HIPAA violation if, if it got into the hands of FBI. If it got into the hands of FBI informants um, in, um, or government entities. So I was just kind of curious how you've seen it affect the medical sciences and especially anybody who has a medical degree as well as a PhD. Is there, I'm not sure if that's, is that directed toward me? Um, any of you really, but yeah. Um. Yeah, it's on. Is it on? Um, oh, sure, sure. Sorry, yeah, the mic was off. So I was just saying that um, it, it, it obviously would affect the medical sciences and especially people who are, have medical degrees as well as PhDs, but that also includes patient data, which could be a major HIPAA violation if they, they try to take the passwords out of computers and cell phones and things that contain patient data. So I was just curious how you've seen it affect the medical care as well. I, I have not seen it affect doctors. Okay. Um, the only cases I've had are involving people getting grant research funds. And, um, you know, the fact that a laptop might have patient information, if that's not being released, I don't even think, I, you know, I don't know that that would pose a HIPAA violation in and of itself. So I don't see it affecting doctors. Yeah, let me just add that the university, as our university, as many universities, have really tried to emphasize to faculty that if you're traveling with a laptop, not just if you're traveling to China, but if you're traveling with a laptop, you should not have um, personal data, students, patients, personal data on it. Um, and I'll just do a little shout out to the ITS. I mean, they will give you loaner laptops if you need to travel with a laptop. Um, I do think this is an issue, and I think it, you know, from the research security side, um, it, is, it is also completely, uh, well, common might be the wrong word, but it is certainly not unheard of for um, Chinese officials to investigate laptops, phones, et cetera, at the border. And so, um, you know, I think the, the sort of, the, the right caution is to take as little with you as you need. There's a question. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. I just, uh, uh, anecdotal, because this is really hard to get the data. But at least, uh, say, in two places, the one is the mass general, the other is on the west coast. 
uh, uh, friends in the medical area say, my colleague, I couldn't find a colleague anymore. This, this, was, a, this was a lot of people leaving. That was just to say the fact. And uh, it started with, uh, say, NIH, say, and, uh, Anderson, uh, say, school of, uh, say, uh, say in, in Texas, right? Anderson School of Investigation, and some people were forced to uh, resign. But I just want to uh, say, echo what uh, I just oh. said. Nowadays, when I travel, it takes me half day just uh, to at least get my computer file that I had to bring with and transfer to a new computer and uh, erase everything and then prepare. Because in theory, I should bring, a, uh, say, also empty cell phone. But for me, it was like, what I do with this empty cell phone? So I just learned how to erase my cell phone before I get in the border, uh, go through the custom and download from the cloud. <laughs> we have a question right here. Yeah, I want to thank uh, the panel for this wonderful session. And it's quite clear from what many of you have said that there's been a uh, distinct failure of leadership at, at practically all U.S. universities, except for maybe for MIT. And, and so my question to you is, to anybody in the panel, is what can we as faculty, as students, staff do when we hear about these kinds of situations, especially if it doesn't get to the level of criminal activity. Uh, and because, as you don't well know, the, the university is not a democracy. It, it's an autocracy. And these things are handled in complete secrecy, even from the people that are being investigated. So what could we do to try to prevent this from happening? Uh, I, I'll just uh, say, say what I know, right? And uh, uh, as I said, uh, I'm the luckiest, uh, really, among lucky people. And the, the fact that the MIT faculty stood up, uh, the, uh, the uh, professor, you all think, uh, really, the light, uh, uh, see, I was arrested. Uh, he, he, in his own words, he said, he thought that uh, after Charlie Lieber was arrested uh, at Harvard, they're going to get somebody from MIT. That's what he, his own word. And so uh, in his, uh, he said that when the lightning stroke, a strike, uh, he jumped on. So in this case, in my case, it was very clear that colleagues speak out really saved me. And you can also go to, I mean, whose case, even though the university leadership was not supported by the Later on, the faculty senate really stood up, f speak for him, and that that helped him tremendously. So I think a colleague's support is is really crucial. And uh, uh, the other challenge is the fact that uh, uh, once a faculty gets investigated, the advice he or she gets this is. A, of course, uh, Peter is here, and uh, from a Negro side, don't talk to anybody. So the university, uh, uh, say, leadership will tell the faculty don't talk to anybody, and the, the legal side also advises don't talk to anybody. The problem is when there's nobody knows the case, how people could help. So mm -hmm. there got to be some sort of trust channel that people can relay that and can voice their concern. We've been working with government and we say, one demand that we want from government, the funding agency, is giving people a chance to defend themselves before they suspend their, their grants. Right? They, there's a faculty member from another university. She said she fired, she asked her secretary to fire a disclosure to Army and the secretary didn't file, or the, the, the grants person didn't file for the NSF because uh, she looked like the time she got a gift to university from a Chinese company didn't have overlap with the NSF funding. But NSF suspended her grants because it said she didn't report. Uh, can I uh, just add? I just, uh, I've been thinking about this uh, for the past few years and has always been wondering whether it's possible to have some collective effort across universities 
you know, uh, in our interview of a scientist, uh, they all take uh, MIT as a rule model <laughs> and use that benchmark to complain with uh, about their own university. Uh, I found, you know, if there's some, you know, these leading universities, I don't know whether my think it's too naive given I know that US is a very decentralized uh, system, uh, education system, but I, you know, believe, if at least I, my humble opinion would say that some collective action, you know, joint with, you know, group universities having some guideline uh, would be very, very useful. Uh, I'm very curious, like, whether uh, Professor Gang Cheng and, and the, whether Peter would think this is a feasible uh, policy suggestion. Um, do you want? Let, to yeah, ahead. let me just add um, that I see some of the former um, presidents of the Association of Chinese Professors here in the room. The, uh, the Association of Chinese Professors here at UM has really been proactive in trying to not just um, you know, sort of stand up for professors when we hear something has gone on, but to create conversations with university leadership. Um, and I, you know, without go, and, and to have, to make those conversations routine, um, so that hopefully university leadership um, understands the ways in which these kinds of investigations can be completely unfair and unproductive for their faculty. Um, different, University leaders are differently um, interested in having these routine conversations. But, you know, I think that anytime we are hiring a university president, a university provost, a university vice provost for research, these are the kinds of questions that we as faculty who participate in governance should be asking about candidates and telling selection committees that they need to consider. I, I know we're out of time. Um, I wanted just to note something that struck me in some of the remarks, um, and then I'll ask a very quick question on Zoom, since I did ask Zoom uh, audience to um, to submit questions. But I, you know, there are things about the way in which the U.S. government has behaved in the China Initiative that seem to be modeling practices in China. So, for example, um, this idea of a quota, you know, kind of every, every um, agency across the United States um, from the DOJ has to uh, find a case that is um, just directly out of um, Chinese governance practices, this kind of uh, quota system. Um, and, and even uh, the use of the term that was used by the FBI at the time, which was whole of government response, again, that is um, borrowed again from. So it's very unfortunate that the US, um, despite its proclamation to, um, you know, to disavow um, uh, autocracy or, or this kind of um, top-down behavior has um, engaged in very similar practices. Um, and I think to be not cynical, but to be realistic about the goals of the China Initiative, I think that the goals of the China Initiative were not to crack down on fraud, um, but rather to break ties between US scientists and Chinese scientists, and that it has done that very effectively. Um, and so, you know, in some of Reisha's, um, in Professor Jia's um, charts, and showing this decline in collaboration, I think that was exactly the goal. And the goal um, worked to the detriment of many people's lives and to the detriment of U.S. science overall. But I think um, those goals are less important to the U.S. government presently. Um, to get back to the Zoom question, which is a very practical question, probably from somebody who has been interrogated at the border, I would like to learn advice about how to handle custom inquiries. Should I cooperate or should I get a lawyer? And I think this is for Peter to answer. <laughs> well, it, it depends. Um, it, 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 the answer is it depends. Um, if you're a foreign national, uh, coming to the United States, you're not a citizen, um, you are subject to search. And um, you really don't have any, you know, you could say no. Um, they don't have to let you into the country. Um, if you're a U.S. citizen and they're, you know, they, again, they have a right to um, inspect your belongings. Um, the trickier question is when they ask for your um, password and, and, and try to access 
your devices. Um, you can say no. Um, you know, the, the thing you, <laughs> the matrix of decision making you have to go is, you know, how long do I want to sit here at this airport? And how long is this going to take? And I've got a meeting to go to. I've got a family to go to. Do, do I, am I standing on principle? Do I, do I real, does it really matter? You know, a lot of times people feel like, no, I'm not hiding anything. But no, I don't really care for you to be, you know, mm -hmm. rummaging around my, my stuff. So, um, you know, the, the trickier question, and I don't know the answer to, is where they, um, nowadays with devices, you, uh, you know, you just use your face or your thumbprint. And um, the question is whether they can, um, mm -hmm. you know, Forced they're not asking you for your picture, but they could hold the phone up to your face. And are you allowed to cover your face or what have you? I, and I really don't know the answer to that. Thank you. I'm very sorry that we've run out of time. This was a great discussion. I want to thank our panelists and the Faculty Senate for organizing, organizing this important event. Thank you so much. Thank you.